Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to invite you all to our monthly convening of the Inference Colloquium series. Today, we have an exciting talk from one of the core members of our interdisciplinary team, Dr. Janan Ismail, who is a preeminent philosopher of science and on the faculty at Columbia University. But before I introduce her more formally, I would first like to thank uh, Mr. and Mrs. Richard and Barbara Frankie for their generosity and support of Yale's flagship interdisciplinary program, the Frankie Program in Science and the Humanities, and many other activities at Yale. Um, I think they were planning to join us uh, here today, so welcome. Um, I would like to remind you all that as we are recording this event, and therefore all participants must mute their videos, if you wish, uh, please go ahead and submit your questions through the chat feature. Uh, per custom, um, Ty, Dr. Ty Camp and I will be monitoring the chat and we'll read out the questions after the talk in the Q&A session. So on to our speaker today. Um, Professor Janan Ismail joined the faculty at Columbia University in 2018. And most of her research work falls into sort of two sort of classes, two big sets of questions. The first is um, circumscribes the central concerns of philosophy of physics. And in that realm, her interests include the structure of space and time, the foundations of quantum mechanics, the role of simplicity and symmetry in physics, questions about the nature of probability, natural laws, and causal relations. So uh, as you can see, all rather big and important, very significant foundational questions. And the second set of interests include uh, mind, cognition, phenomenology, and the nature of perspectives. Janan received her PhD from Princeton University, was a Mellon Fellow at Stanford after that, and then taught at the University of Arizona before coming to Columbia. She is the recipient of many honors and um, awards, and I will just mention a few. Um, she has held several prestigious fellowships, including an NEH Fellowship at the National Humanities Center, a Queen Elizabeth II Research Fellowship from the Australian Research Council, and fellowships from the Templeton Foundation and the Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Science at Stanford. And I'm also delighted to let you all know that her conversant at the discussion session tomorrow, which will start at the same time, is Professor uh, Jim Woodward, who is a distinguished professor in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science at the University of Pittsburgh. And I will tell you more about him tomorrow. And before turning over the floor to Janan, I would like to remind uh, you of some of our ongoing and forthcoming projects um, at the Frankie program. I would particularly like to mention the Learning by Doing project, which is a collection of simple videos for uh, children to teach them uh, how science works, and the set of upcoming inference project talks. Uh, so our next inference uh, project talk will be in October uh, by Brian Cantwell Smith. And um, uh, meanwhile, with the Frankie program, we have a distinguished speaker series talks by Jordan Ellenberg in early October, October 6th, and by Hazel Carby uh, on November 3rd. Uh, so anyway, without further ado, uh, once again, a warm welcome to you all and to you, Janan, and to Jim. Uh, Janan, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks so much for having me and special thanks um, to Jim Woodward for agreeing to um, be the conversant tomorrow. So let me just, so there's been an kind of enormous burgeoning of interest in causation across the sciences and the details of various kinds are easy to locate. So one can open up a journal in microbiology and be assailed with detailed models of the causal structure of cells and proteins. One can find textbooks on the increasing array of computational tools for causal search and discovery and take classes devoted to, for example, formal methods and causal modeling. Psychologists are unraveling new details about how people use ca causal concepts in reasoning. And while details of these kinds are in abundant supply, it's not easy to find among them an answer to the question of what causation is or how it fits into um, a physics-based ontology. So I'm gonna to try to fill that hole by assembling the pieces of our understanding, emerging scientific understanding of causation into an account of where and how causation arises in the architecture of the physical world. 
with special attention to the contested questions of where the direction of causation comes from, its connection to the second law of thermodynamics and the relationship between causation and agency. So if you've been attending other talks in the series, um, you'll have heard about some of these things. What I um, say will have the most in common with Carlo Rovelli's beautiful talk, which opened the series with maybe a little more focused attention on the philosophical questions. So this will sort of bring things back around full circle. It, I'm gonna adopt a very high level perspective, kind of pulling our gaze away from details to try to pull the big pieces into place to get an overall view of the whole vista. So if one looks back um, at the early history of science, it can be seen as developing out of systematization and abstraction of causal thinking, the search for an understanding of the causal relations among events. That is as true of physics as it is of the other sciences. So I think it's not wrong to say as Russell, Bertrand Russell did in 1955, that the aim of phys physics consciously or unconsciously has always been to discover what we may call the causal skeleton of the world. Now, at first, the notion of cause retained its close connection with mechanical ideas. So a cause was something that brought about its effect by a transfer of force. But by the time Newton had finished with it, causation didn't appear in the final presentation of his own theory at all. What he put in the place of causal relations are mathematical equations, oops, sorry, mathematical equations, usually expressed in the form of differential equations that give the rate of change of a quantity over time. Causes and the associated idea of force dropped out of the final presentation entirely. There's no direction and there's no asymmetry of determination. Later events determine earlier ones as surely as earlier ones determine later ones. And it's clear from the quote that I just said about um, earlier from Russell, that Russell actually came around to thinking quite differently. But 32 years earlier, he wrote in a paper on the notion of cause, that's the starting point of all, all almost every discussion of causation and physics. Okay. Now in that paper, Russell noted that the kinds of laws that Newtonian mechanic gives us are so different from causal relations as traditionally conceived, that's misleading to think of them in causal terms at all. And he urged that, sorry, I keep doing this, sorry. He urged that causation is a folk notion that has no place in a mature science. The modern discussion of causation in the philosophy of science really began after Russell with Cartwright's deeply influential critique of Russell's paper. And what Cartwright pointed out was that dynamical laws can't play the role of causal relations in science because specifically causal information is needed to distinguish effective from ineffective strategies for bringing about ends. So for example, it might be true as a matter of law because smoking causes bad breath that there's a strong positive correlation between bad breath and cancer. But it is not true that bad breath causes cancer and hence it's not true that treating bad breath is an effective strategy for preventing cancer. And that difference, the difference between being correlated with cancer and being a way of bringing it about is not one that can be captured by looking at only at the dynamical laws. So if one wants to avoid getting cancer, one has to know not simply what cancer is correlated with as a matter of physical law, but what causes it, that is what brings it about. So this was Cartwright's observation, and it led to a lot of hand wringing, wondering what causal information adds to the kind of global dynamical laws that Russell took as paradigmatic of physical laws. And philosophers played around a little bit with probabil probabilistic and counterfactual analyses. And there were a lot of unresolved questions about the metaphysics of causal relations. One strand in contemporary discussion followed Russell in denying that physics has any real place for causation and continued to reject causal talk as anything but folk physics. Now, in the last 15 years or so, however, there's been a real revolution in our understanding of causal thinking, 
stemming from a lot allied developments in a coalition of fields from computer science to psychology. And it was really the structural causal modeling framework from Pearl and um, sort of parallel developments in Spurty's Gleamore and Shyness, and its philosophical development by Jim Woodward that transformed the discussion. So what the framework does is it gives us a precise formal framework for um, representing causal relationships that's well suited to causal search and discovery in science. It's been at the center of developments in causal learning and st statistical inference. It can be used to define normative solutions to causal inference and judgment problems. It's facilitated new insights into the role of causal thinking and cognition. The influence and the power of that framework are undisputed and largely due to its utility in, concrete in raising concrete scientific questions that can be um, investigated in the laboratory. From a philosophical point of view, what it's done is helped us resolve, I think, the puzzle brought out by the exchange between Russell and Cartwright, that is the disappearance of causes from the fundamental level of uh, physical description on the one hand, and their indispensability and practical reasoning on the other. And the way that it resolves the puzzle is by giving us an articulated understanding of where and how causation, or better, causal thinking and the structures that support causal thinking arise in the architecture of the cosmos. And in the way that is characteristic of philosophical questions, once they pass into the hands of the sciences, it's transformed some of the old questions while also raising new ones. So just to highlight a few feature, relevant features of the formalism, so type causation is basic, that is causation between types of events and it's relative to networks. So type causation relates types of events like the striking of a match of a specified kind under, under given circumstances, rather than the particular striking of a particular match at a particular time and place. And this accords well with science, because um, uh, with practice in science, because science is to a large part devoted to the, the identification of type causal relationships. Networks are defined by collections of variables. Individual properties are represented by the values of variables. The choice of which variables to include and which to leave out of a network when studying a causal claim make a difference to whether there is a causal link between a pair of variable, variables and what the link is. Singular causal claims, so like the, the claim that a dot on a photographic plate was caused by the impact of an electron, those are derived from type causation. DAGs, this is just again introducing relevant features of the formalism. DAGs, directed acyclic graphs, are used to represent causal relations among variables in a network. So direct causation is represented by an arrow. Um, and it's the most basic causal relation in a network. A variable, xi, for example, is a direct cause of another variable xj relative to a set of variables v, just in case there's an in, just in case there is an intervention on the first that will change the value of the second or change the probability distribution over values of the second when all of the variables in the network in question except those two are held fixed. So DAGs, these diagrams, give us a perspicuous way of displaying causal relationships. An example like this, you can see immediately how intervening on one variable will affect other variables in the network. Okay. Now, from the point of view of this framework, causal judgments in everyday contexts rely on loose and tacit assumptions about which variables are being considered, what's being held fixed in situ for the purposes of assessing the effects of one variable on another. Those choices are made explicit in the formalization. And because it makes them explicit, it lets us separate the objective content of causal claims from the sort of loose context dependent pragmatic factors that guide the choice of the network. So the question that comes out of the Russell Cartwright exchange was, how does causal information recall go beyond the information captured in dynamical laws? That is, what does causal information add to those laws? Or if it doesn't add anything, 
what information contained in those laws does it make explicit? So here's the way to think of it. Global dynamical laws, the kinds of laws that Newton's theory gave us, give us information about the relationships between global states at different times. Causal information is information about the results of hypothetical interventions, where by that we mean in questions about what would happen if a variable were separated from its earlier history and allowed to vary freely. Now, the difficulty of, um, with extracting causal information from global dynamical laws is that the global dynamical laws don't allow the separation of a variable from its own past causes. So here's an example. Suppose someone um, presents you with something like this, a schematized model of an engine for a car. It has a collection of components, a piston, an engine block, a timing chain, a crankshaft, and so on. Now the parts move, but so long as they're assembled in the form of an engine, they, they have a restricted range of motion relative to one another. So if we model the engine, so if we model the engine at the level of description that treats these functional components as basic parts, we can come up with dynamical equations that would describe how the global state of the engine varies over time. And those dynamical equations for the engine would tell you that there's a fixed relationship with, for example, the pistons and the valve. Okay. So given the equations, you could use the position of one of those things to calculate the position of the other. So maybe when one is up, the other is down. When the other is down, the other one is up. Okay. They move, but they move together. Okay. And if you just looked at the, equa the equations, there would be three causal hypotheses that you might come up with. Right? One is that the position of A causes the position of B, that the position of B causes the position of A, or that they have a, a common cause. Now remember, the global dynamical equations just fix the relative values of A and B. Okay. These three hypotheses, however, have different modal implications. So if A causes B, then if you kept everything else fixed and you reached in and you moved A up and down, you should be able to see B move as well. So that's what you would be committed to if you asserted that A causes B. If B causes A, then the other thing holds. You should be able to reach in um, and move B, keeping everything else fixed, and A should move. If the two have a common cause, then neither of these interventions should affect the value of the other since the common cause C would be left unaffected and it's the thing that causes both. Okay. Now, in the case of an open system like a car engine, interventions from the outside are physically realizable and often in a way that serves to effectively separate the variable from its own past causes inside the system of interest. Okay. I'll say a little bit more about this below, but what the example here does is it makes the logical point that how that that the dynamical equations for the engine of, um, as a whole don't tell you which of these hypotheses are correct because the counterfactuals that you need to discriminate between these hypotheses, between the three causal hypotheses here, namely what would happen if we could hold everything else fixed and intervene from the outside to alter the variable of one of the values in the network those counterfactuals are physically impossible. There is no model of the engine as a whole compatible with its global dynamical laws in which the antecedence of those counterfactuals is realized. So if the engine comprised the universe as a whole and the global equations were all that we had, then there would be no way of discerning the underlying causal structure of the engine just by looking at the dynamical laws. The reason is not that it, um, the reason that that is, is not that information that we, is not that the information that we can extract from global laws, um, it's not that the laws don't have modal content, it's that the modal content that they have is global. So global laws will tell us what kinds of worlds are possible, right? but they don't tell us what would happen if we, would, if we could intervene on one of those worlds in a way that's contrary to law. So in logical terms, 
we would say the antecedents to intervention counterfactuals are nomologically impossible. That is, they're contrary to law. So if we take the global laws as more basic, we don't generally get causal information. So that tells us something about, in terms of the content of causal claims, what di distinguishes them from what we can get out of global dynamical laws. But it gives rise to another question. And the question is, how is causal knowledge possible at our world? If causal information is information about what would happen if some variable were separated from its past causes and allowed to vary freely, and in fact, no variable is ever actually separated from its past causes, how could we study causal structure? And the answer is that in practical terms, there are various ways of effectively randomizing the values of a variable, which provides a separation, an effective separation from its own past causes so that we can treat changes to the values of that variable as interventions. So for example, flip a coin, have a random number generator, set the value for um, the variable you want to intervene on, let a lab assistant choose one at will. Okay. Any variable that can be manipulated and whose own causes are uncorrelated with the variables of interest, that, that is the variables who's, um, on, who, on which the causal impact of the variable that you're intervening on is the one that you're interested in can be regarded for such purposes as external to the system and changes in the value of such variables can be regarded as interventions. This of course is the essence of scientific experimentation. The possibility of knowledge, of causal knowledge rests on the fact that we can effectively isolate systems in the laboratory, manipulate the external input to them and observe the impacts of our manipulations. And this in its turn tells us something important about how we should think of the metaphysics of causation, or better, I would say, the physical substructure that supports causal belief. And it's this, in a world that is as complicated as ours and which decomposes into a collection of rule governed components where the laws governing configurations can be given in terms of the laws governing components and their interactions, causal information can be extracted from the laws governing components and the interactions. One can concoct very simple examples, sorry, of very simple worlds or worlds in which there are nomological restrictions, that is law-like restrictions on initial conditions in which causal information cannot be extracted from the global laws. But what's really going on is that in those worlds, the global dynamical laws will not allow us to recover laws governing components and interactions. So long as one is willing to take the local nomological structure of the world that as basic, one can ground facts about the results of hypothetical interventions in that structure, that is to say in the laws that govern the components, deriving the global laws from restrictions on configurations of components. And indeed, that's, that follows the standard practice in physics. So when you learn Newtonian physics, for example, you learn that an object will not change its motion unless a force acts on it, that the force on an object is equal to the ma its mass times its acceleration, and that when two objects interact, they exert forces on one another of equal magnitude in opposite directions. So what you learn is really the laws governing the components. You piece together an understanding of the equations of motion for the universe as a whole from an understanding of what its parts are and the laws that govern the components. So I think it's a sort of perversion of the content of physical theories to make a lunge for the global laws and then insist that the full modal content of the theory has to be somehow extractable from the form that they take for a world, for our world, for the particular configurations of components that makes up our world. Now, the relations captured in DAGs, that is intervention as causal relationships, are experimentally accessible. They're often first in the order of discovery. They're part of the surface fabric of the world and almost tailor fit to play the role that Cartwright highlighted when she argued for the indispensability of causal relations in practical reasoning. 
But there's another tradition that comes out of the later Russell, in this case, by way of the philosophers Reichenbach and Nathan, Sa sorry, Wesley Salmon, and that receives its fullest development in Phil Dow's work. And this tradition analyzes causal relations in terms of what he calls causal processes. So causal processes are chains of events that are related by interactions, where a causal interaction is an interaction between um, events or um, objects that involves a local exchange of a conserved quantity. Okay. Causal processes can be defined more directly in terms of microdynamical laws. So causal process, so this is a way of trying to introduce a causal notion that one could connect more directly to the sorts of dynamical laws that are given by Newtonian physics. Causal process and interventionist accounts are sometimes treated as competing accounts of causation, but we don't need to choose between them. They're both useful and in classical physics, we find interpretations or examples of both interventionist causal relationships and causal processes in the, in the Tao tradition. We have causal processes at the fundamental level, and we have the kind of manipulable causal relationships captured by DAGs all over the place. These relationships are undiscriminating about levels, they're neutral about underlying processes. They represent often local scaffolded relations among variables that can be investigated experimentally, frequently without knowledge of the underlying processes. Both moreover, that is both the relationships captured by DAGs and causal processes, both of those notions capture some aspects of our everyday notion of cause. The interventionist relate notion captures the idea that you have a causal connection when one thing can be used to bring about another. Causal processes, on the other hand, capture the idea that influences um, propagate through space, causal influences propagate through space, and that they satisfy the expectation that causal connections should be mediated by mechanisms and that they involve some sort of contact, some sort of local bumping up against one another. So if, if interventionist causal relationships are part of the surface fabric of the world, then you can think of causal processes as part of the deep theoretically postulated substructure that supports the high level relationships captured by DAGs. So I said um, that classical physics gives us both causal processes and the high level causal networks captured by DAGs but there's a puzzle about the relationship between the sort of high level causal pathways and the underlying dynamical processes that's crucial to understanding causal notions of both kinds. So interventionist causal relationships of the kind captured in DAGs have one striking feature. They're temporally asymmetric. So they run in one direction from past to future. And that temporal asymmetry is no mere matter of convention. If we follow Cartwright in saying that what's definitive of causal relationships as distinct from mere probabilistic correlations is that they can function as strategic routes to bringing about ends, then it's manifest and pervasive empirical fact about our world that all known strategic routes to bringing about ends run from past to future. Okay. Uh, so Janan, if I may interrupt, I have a quick question. Sure. So in the absence of microphysical laws, does it mean that causation is not well-defined or it cannot be established? So I'm thinking of something like gravity, right? So you do not have microphysical laws. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm curious, is that um, in the previous slide, you had that as one of the points so causal pro that's true of causal processes. I see. Ah. In Newtonian mechanics, so you're right, in Newtonian mechanics, there's no mechanism for the propagation of gravitational gravity. influence. And that's right. So according to causal process accounts, there's no causal link between, um, so there's no causal mechanism or causal process by which gravitational influence is propagated. Uh, thank you for that. Sure. It's a good question. Thank you for that. So, so let me go back to, okay. Um, 
so as I was saying, the, the temporal asymmetry is no, matter, is no matter of convention. And indeed, of all of the reasons that Russell gave in that early paper for saying that causation had been purged from physics at the fundamental level, this is the one that persuaded most people. The underlying dynamical laws are simply equations of motion that relate the state of the universe at one time to its state at the others. They have no intrinsic direction of determination. So they couldn't, in that sense, be properly called causes. Okay. So now this gives rise to a straightforward physical puzzle, however. How do the kinds of high-level causal pathways that I've said are an objective part of the surface fabric of our world arise from temporally symmetric underlying laws? Now, this isn't the kind of question that people in the lab studying signal pathways in cells and so on typically ask. Scientists who empirically investigate the causal structure, who in, sorry, who empirically investigate causal structure of particular kinds of systems, take it for granted that causal relations run from past to future. So they set up experiments that allow localized interventions and they look for the temporally downstream effects. But it is a theoretical question for the physicist trying to relate the kinds of causal pathways studied in, for example, biology labs to an underlying theory. And as it happens, it's a question that's been illuminated by research into the foundations of thermodynamics. So for those of you who, who don't know the history, that research began in mid 19th century and it was originally focused on trying to derive the phenomenological asymmetries embodied in the second law of thermodynamics from time symmetric laws of classical mechanics. And it turned only quite recently into a very general account of the sources of temporal asymmetry in our world. So a conversation that started by being about why, for example, a gas will disperse to fill an open container but not collect spontaneously um, in one corner, or why ice melts when, a, when placed in a warm glass of water, but we don't see ice cubes spontaneously form out of warm water without a change in temperature. How that turned into a conversation about why, for example, we remember the past, but not the future, and why time seems to flow from past to future, and why causation doesn't run backwards. And as in the revolution in, in our thinking about causation that I said came with the development of the structural causal modeling framework, there was input from both scientists and philosophers that was sort of instrumental to the development. So for example, there's Boltzmann and Maxwell and Gibbs, all scientists, but there was also Reichenbach, David Albert, Hugh Price, all of course, philosophers. So there remains a lot of dispute in the foundations of thermodynamics and dispute in particular about how to understand some of the most important, philosophically important um, temporal asymmetries. But it was really David Albert's account from this this book in 2000 that brought the foundations of thermodynamics into the kind of conceptual focus that made it possible to really attack these questions. So Albert's account, that is the philosophically interesting temporal asymmetries. So Albert's account has three first principles. There's the Newtonian laws of motion, there's a statistical postulate, and there's something that he calls the past hypothesis. So here's how it works. Newtonian laws of motion are just the familiar time symmetric laws that Russell was referring to. The statistical postulate is a probability distribution that assigns a probability distribution to a system being in a given microstate, given its macrostate. Okay? Macrostate is just given by the values of thermodynamic parameters. Um, it's a, the a statistical postulate is a strict addition to the laws, so it doesn't follow from them directly, though there are a lot of attempts to motivate it dynamically. The past hypothesis, the third of these postulates, is a contingent hypothesis about the early history of the world. It, it says that the universe started in a state of low enough entropy to make thermodynamic generalizations applicable for the roughly 15 billion years that we think that those generalizations have, hold, have held. And here's how the account goes. The three postulates work together as follows. Newtonian dynamical laws delimit the space of physically possible worlds. The past hypothesis knocks out all of those worlds that don't start out in a low entropy state. 
And then if you take the initial microstates of the remaining worlds and you apply the Newtonian mechanical dynamical laws, you will see that some of those remaining worlds will be on what are called entropy increasing trajectories. That's, that is to say that their entropy will be increasing from that initial state over its history until it reaches equilibrium. And some of them will be on entropy decreasing trajectories, that is where the entropy will decrease from the initial state. As far as the dynamical laws go, there will be worlds of both kinds in the remaining set. The statistical postulate then will enter in and provide a, a probability distribution over the worlds that overwhelmingly favors those on entropy increasing trajectories. Okay. So the result of these three things is that the most probable, and not just the most probable, but the overwhelmingly most probable history of the universe is one wherein entropy rises. Okay. Now, Albert himself gives the account at the global level, where I mean, he, 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 get, he presents it in exactly the way that I just said, that you have a probability distribution over worlds and, um, and you apply the, the whole account at the level of worlds as a whole. One need not do that. Formally, it works just as well for some local adiabatically isolated subsystem of the world, that is a system that's not exchanging energy um, with its environment. And indeed, there are good reasons for thinking that, that, that the story might best be told at that level. Why? Because those are the systems to which thermodynamics is typically applied. And second, it's not obvious whether the local story follows from the global one. I think it does, but it's not, it's not as perspicuous as if you give the story directly at the local level. And finally, the probabilities have a much clearer interpretation if the story is told at the local level. Okay. So if you look at Albert's postulates, the Newtonian laws are time symmetric. They run, the, the, there is no direction of determination built in to them. And the statistical postulate is also time independent. So the only time asymmetric assumption is the past hypothesis. Okay. You know that the, the initial state of the world is low entropy, but there's no corresponding um, boundary condition in the future. And it's a particularly crucial part of the story because it's doing all of the explanatory work in terms of deriving the, um, the um, temporal asymmetries. Um, there's been some important discussion about the right form for that hypothesis. Everybody agrees that some kind of temporal asymmetry and boundary conditions is need, needs to be assumed to extract the temporal asymmetries of thermodynamics. In Albert's account, it's the low entropy state for the universe at some time in its distant past. Matthias Frisch, in a discussion of the asymmetries embodied in causal reasoning, has shown that there are different ways of expressing the time asymmetric assumptions that are needed to generate the sorts of asymmetries that would support causal inferences. So he points out that it would do just as well, for example, to assume a causal Markov condition. That is that any node in a DAG is conditionally independent of its non-descendants non given its parents, or as an assumption about of microscopic randomness in the initial but not final state of a system. I think there's no substantive question about which of these assumptions is more fundamental. You can derive them from one another. There are different ways of describing the structures that, that is to say the contingent asymmetries in our world that support causal inferences running from past to future. Others have pointed out that in the explanatory story, what's really needed to generate thermodynamic generalizations is not really an initial low entropy, but the randomness or uniformity of the early um, universe that matters. So while there's a lot sort of to sort out here. What there is is broad agreement that pending the mathematical conjectures on which this account rests, the local macroscopic asymmetries in our part of the universe have their origin in the fact about the state of our universe in the distant past that developed under effectively classical laws into a world with the sorts of emergent macroscopic asymmetries captured in thermodynamics generalizations. Now, if one is interested in how this story connects specifically to causal inference, one will be interested in, in, in um, some sort of different ways of stating the assumptions that are needed to derive the asymmetries. 
If one's more interested in Cartwright's idea that if you're given a body of correlations, the causal pathways are the ones that can be used as strategic routes to bring about ends, here's how to get that in a way that connects more naturally to that idea. Okay. So this is a conception of causation that brings um, the connection to agency into the foreground and connects to people's pre-theoretic idea that causation is something that you can use to bring about ends. If we start in a world with the thermodynamic gradient and we hold fixed all of the information embodied in the present surveyable macroscopic state of the world, so the kind of information that an agent has just by looking around her. And here I don't mean just what you get by looking around you and holding fixed the ambient temperature and dispositions of medium-sized dry goods. I mean, you hold fixed all of the information embodied in libraries, scientific databases, all of the information that we've somehow amassed and recorded or that we could have accessed and recorded. And we ask, what's the probabilistic effect holding all of that fixed of local interventions on the present state of the environment of a kind that are possible in practical terms for agents like us? So you manipulate some feature of your local environment and you apply the probability postulate to obtain a probability distribution over the possible microstate of the world. And then you evolve that forward or backward in time using the classical mechanical laws. Here's what happens. If you're just evolving it forward or backward with the classical micromechanical laws, you can't really predict much about either the past or the future. Why? Because there are lots of different ways that the world could be. Everything depends on the actual microstate of the universe. And you don't need to just know what's going on locally microscopically here. You need to know what's going on everywhere. You need the microstate of the universe as a whole to predict anything with the classical laws. If, however, we conditionalize on the low entropy um, state in the distant past, then the probabilities of past events of which we have any kind of macroscopic record will be unaltered, but the intervention will raise the probability of certain kinds of macroscopic future events. Okay. Now the backward part of this, that is the question of what makes something a record and the reason that a conditionalizing under low entropy past makes the macroscopic present full of records. That's something that's been extensively studied. So if you went to Carla Rovelli's talk, for example, the first, that, the first in the series that I mentioned, he did a beautiful job of making explicit the physics of that. But the way to think of it, and, and well, I'm, I'm, the, and the way that one has to think of, uh, there's a little bit more that needs to be added here, which is that one has to think of the internal, one has to think in a certain way of the internal dynamics of the agent. Right? But what I'm trying to show you is how all of these pieces together, fit together conceptually at the macro scale to help us understand causation. And the way to think of it, um, to get the causal stuff into it, is that the causal asymmetry is really the flip side of the asymmetry of records. So when you intervene in the local environment, there will be traces in the future of your intervention. Okay? And when you, it's, it's what, you, what you'll be doing is you'll be doing some work. You jump into a swimming pool, you leave a footprint in the sand, you dig a ditch or you build a house. And what you're doing from a physical perspective is you're creating an ordered state of the environment that will take some time to decay. Okay? So what you think of as the effects of your action are the future records of its occurrence. That means if we look for the strategic routes for bringing about ends, if we look for ways of doing something in the here and now that will make a difference to, the to probabilities of future events, of probabilities of events at other times and places, we will find that there's nothing that one can do to make a difference to the past, but there's a lot that we can do to make a difference to the future. So the causal asymmetry is just the flip side of the asymmetry of records. What you're doing when you act in the, in the here and now is you're creating future records of your present action. Now, so far, everything that I've said stays at the level of physical structure. 
We've talked about the temporally symmetric laws, about the asymmetric interventionist pathways that can be studied in the lab and captured in DAGs. We have the external infrastructure in place that describes the macroscopic fabric of the world. Now we're in a position to talk about causal concepts. So we've moved from talking about structure in the world, that is external infrastructure in the, env in the environment, to talking about something that has a role in an agent's internal cognitive economy. Okay. To do that, we need to introduce an agent and we couple the agent to the macroscopic structure of the world. What is an agent? An agent is a system whose job it is to extract information from the environment and use it to guide behavior. It is coupled to the world via sensory and motor pathways that give it macroscopic information and sensory feedback on its own interventions. And so now we ask, how do causal concepts arise? which is to say we look at the role that those concepts play in an internal inferential network that's linked to perception at one end and to action at another. So an agent that is an agent like this that's coupled to the environment by sensors and actuators and it's getting macroscopic information, okay, will be interested in how, in knowing how what it does affects what it sees. And causal concepts will be defined both by their connections to perception and to action. And the sciences that are relevant to studying causal concepts, now looking not at the world, but looking at the agent and um, the way that her causal concepts are nested in her internal economy, the sciences that are relevant to study that are, are psychology, cognitive science, and there's just a wealth of fascinating work on causal cognition and learning on the development of causal ideas, on their role in inference, decision, and action, and moral judgment. So if we step back and we take a kind of cross-section of the world ordered by scale, and we look at the layers of structure from the microscopic all the way up to the macroscopic, up to the level of the human being interacting with the macroscopic environment, okay, the picture that's sort of coming into focus looks something like this. Okay. At the bottom layer, there's the geometry of space-time, which in a classical setting imposes or embodies constraints on the causal connectability of events. And by that, I mean their connectability by causal processes. Okay. There's the matter content, okay. and there's the temporally symmetric microscopic laws that tell us how the matter in one volume of space-time affects the matter in another volume of space-time or how the state of the world at one time relates to its state at another. And then there's the emergent macroscopic asymmetries. And the macroscopic asymmetries arise, remember, because of the low entropy boundary condition at one end of the universe. The macroscopic asymmetries in their turn support the emergence of creatures that use information to guide behavior. Because of the way that the macroscopic asymmetries um, allow the present state of the world to contain records, information, it makes the macroscopic state of rich with information that agents can use. Eventually, those agents get complex enough that they do something that we would recognize as thinking. And then by the time we get to creatures like us, thinking is causal from stem to stern. Now, while there's not much that's known and various points of dispute, the sketch that I just gave is, is robust with respect to most of the emerging details. And notice how much it transforms both our understanding of causation and our understanding of ourselves. It's very different from anything that we might that might have come out of simply reflection on the concept of cause. No single part of this story is the story of what causes are. But I think that once all of the pieces are assembled, there's no further question, no story about the metaphysics of causation that needs to be answered. There are two questions that philosophers always want to ask about causes. They want to ask, um, are causes inside or outside the head? Are they part of the mind independent fabric of reality or are they in the eye of the observer? And they want to ask, where does the asymmetry come from? To take the second one first, we've just seen a rather complex answer to the source of the asymmetry. 
what we saw was that there's not a single asymmetry, but rather a couple of related asymmetries. There's a thermodynamic gradient created by low entropy state of the universe, which creates a macroscopic asymmetry that in its turn supports the emergence of information gathering and utilizing systems. When such systems get sufficiently complex, information and gathering and utilization takes the form of conceptual activity. Creatures like this develop causal concepts with a built-in asymmetry that reflects an asymmetry in their practical and epistemic relationship to the world. So while there's no fundamental asymmetric relation of determination in physics, for creatures like us, who couple to the macroscopic structure of the world, the fact that information flows from, from the past and causal information runs into the future is a fundamental informative feature of our experience and one that frames every aspect of our thoughtful engagement with the world and one that's built into all of our concepts. Now on the question of whether causes are inside or outside the head, the right thing to say is partly inside and partly outside for the reasons that I just gave. Our pre-scientific ideas about causation aren't really, I think, articulated enough to single out one part of this layered structure that leads from microscopic processes all the way up to the coupled interaction between agent environment in which causal thinking has its home as where the causes are. Scientifically, there's no uniform usage. Physicists will speak of spatiotemporal geometry as encoding causal structure, but when biologists talk about causal structure, they mean something much higher in that stratigraphic hierarchy. When ordinary people talk about causation, they invoke ideas closely associated with the phenomenology of pushing and pulling, something with a sort of quasi-muscular notion of compulsion in mind. We can see how all of these ideas arise and how they relate to one another. And I don't really see that there's a factual question to be settled about which of them captures the essence of causation or about which point, at which point in that hierarchy we finally really have causes. Now notice that this kind of account is different from what we might think of as the prototypical philosophical analysis of a concept. And it's characteristic of the way in which we get a scientific account of, um, of a notion, that what, one of those notions that play a central role in mediating our practical and epistemic interaction with the world. Other notions that are like this, I think, are probability and um, information to some extent. There's an external component that is the infrastructure in the environment that agents use as strategic pathways to bringing about ends. And there's also an internal component, an account of the content of causal concepts, understood partly in terms of their role um, in, in an internal inferential network. And a big part of understanding what causation is, is fitting those pieces together. It's saying how agents with the kind of information that we have and our practical capacities for intervention in a world that is objectively structured like ours, how those agents develop and use causal ideas. So there are two philosophically, I'm almost done, the two philosophically important aspects of the account. One is that it secures the objectivity of causal relations, making them apt objects for scientific study. And the second is that it's a really good antidote to reifying causal relations as compulsive asymmetric relations between local events built right into the fundamental fabric of the world. There are causal pathways written into the fabric of the world, but those pathways are neither asymmetric nor compulsive. We see, I think, that the complete account of the metaphysics of causation is given by the facts about our world and about our position in it that support the acquisition and the use of causal concepts. And that account does not treat causal relationships as asymmetric, pushy relations of dependence that are writ into the fundamental fabric of the world. But it makes causal relations objective in all of the ways that should matter to science. It makes perfect sense to think of science as devoted to, as Russell put it in his later years, discovering the causal skeleton of the world. So I think of this kind of account as a side on view. The side on view brings into focus 
the assemblage, a side on view, because it takes a kind of side on look at the, at the, the agent and it, it, coupled to the world and the processes that mediate its interaction. Okay. Now the side on view brings into focus an assemblage of different structures, starting with geometry, becoming progressively more articulated by the context and coming into sharp relief in their distinctive role in practical reasoning for situated agents. There are a number of well-defined precise concepts, as I said, that can be introduced to talk about structures at different levels of this edifice. For the reasons that I gave, I think no account of causal concepts that doesn't bring out their distinctive role in practical reasoning and the way in which causal concepts are structured by that role can be complete. But, but we can talk about causal structure in the stripped down sense that applies just at the level of fundamental geometry. Okay, so that's the difference between causal structure and causal concepts. Okay. At that level, one thinks of space-time as encoding relations of causal co connectability. One can talk about also causal structure in a way that links it to physical processes, as in the tradition that leads from Salmon through Phil Dow. One can also talk about causal structure in a way that connects it to the kinds of emergent pathways captured in DAGs. Or one can talk about it in a way that ties it to agency with all of the articulation and inferential and practical commitments that come from being embedded in a whole network of concepts. These notions don't compete. We shouldn't insist on a single notion that's gonna serve all of these purposes. Each one of them is well-defined and we can see how causal notions become increasingly structured, increasingly articulated as the setting is enriched is precisely because the notion I think spans all of these levels from fundamental geometry up through the agent strategic pathways that it is so useful in linking them together. Um, as I said, I think something similar can be said of probability and information. It's precisely the level spanning character of these notions that makes them particularly well suited to bridging the divide between purely physical description and the structured interface that the mind brings to its understanding of nature. Okay, so the question uh, about- Jana, yeah. quick question. And uh, this is really beautiful, the side on view, really powerful. Uh, I was just wondering, is there um, any ordering, preferred ordering? Are this like a hierarchy of ways of looking or are these just, um, is there an ordering in these? Um, so there is a physical ordering. So if one starts, so that's why I said, if one starts with physical structure ordered by scale, then at the bottom level, there's gonna be geometry yeah, that is sort of, you know, you can characterize geometry independently of the matter content. And then when you enrich it with the matter content, then you get like causal process notions. And then when you add a thermodynamic gradient, you get the asymmetry. So there's a sort of natural physical ordering. And as you add more to the physical, uh, to the physical description of the system, you get increasingly enriched notions of causation. So that's the way that I'm picturing it. Right. So it's just that the agents are really what I, um, um, or what I had a sort of question about, right? Whether these agents, um, you could have some conception of the agents, even as you look at the connectability, right? So you may have some notion of um, agency, which you know st stands to be verified and consolidated. But I was just curious about that. But Okay, so you're putting your finger on something that um, it would take, a, I mentioned in passing, and it would take a good deal more um, to, to sort of articulate in a convincing way. But yeah. the way that I think about it is that it's actually the thermodynamic gradient and the fact that the thermodynamic gradient makes the macroscopic structure of the world rich with information that explains the emergence of agents in evolutionary terms. So if you think that what agents are is by their nature, so to speak, what they're designed to do is be information gathering and utilizing creatures, then in a world where there's no thermodynamic gradient, there's gonna be no agents. So agents were designed and selected because of the opportunities for information gathering and use that's provided by the thermodynamic gradient. They arise, so to speak, to take advantage of those opportunities. And then that in its turn explains why um, agents like us, are, um, our senses are coupled to the macroscopic 
um, structure of the world. So sometimes people, I know we're almost out of time, so I'll be I'll say this quickly and maybe we can um, talk about it more. But I think what what um, people sometimes speak as though when you say that really the asymmetry arises with the thermodynamic gradient and it's a macroscopic um, coarse graining imposed by the thermodynamic gradient that gives rise to the asymmetry, they sometimes say, oh, so it's just an artifact of the fact that we happen to have senses that parse the world, that see in a coarse grained way. And I think the right direction of that, you know, when you see the whole assemblage in the way that I've sketched it, the yeah. right way to see the direction of explanation is we see in macroscopic terms because that's where the, um, the opportunities for gathering and using information yeah. Um, wow. yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And I mean, we can continue this offline. I, I, I get what you were. Um, um... Good. Okay. Well, I'm almost done. So I'll, I'll end quickly then. So the general idea, and this is just a concluding um, to bring it back around. The general idea is that the question, of, the question of how causation arises in the structure of the cosmos has been a live one since Russell observed that it appears to have disappeared from the fundamental level of physical description. So in 2003, Hartree Field called this, quote, the central problem in the metaphysics of causation. And it's a question that's animated a good deal of, of recent discussion um, in, in philosophy. I transformed that question into the question of how causation arises, uh, the question of how causation arises into the question of how causal thinking and the structures that support causal thinking arise. And then assembled the pieces of, of what we have learned about causation in the last 20 or 30 years into the outline of an answer to those questions and suggested that once those questions are answered, there's no specifically metaphysical question about causation that remains. So this sort of naturalist, this is a kind of naturalistic pragmatism that seems to me the only sensible way, only sensible way to approach ontological questions, whether it's a question of what cows are, what causation is, or what democracy is. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much, Anand, for this really uh, thought-provoking and um, sort of exquisite explanation. I mean, there are obviously really deep foundational questions, and it's really sort of testimony to your clarity that you touched upon many of them. So. I would like to give a big round of applause and I see a lot of people uh, have the clap emoji on. So at least I wanted to give you an auditory clap. <laughs> Thank you so much. So I think we'll open up for questions now. So um, I noticed there's a question uh, from Alexander Meehan. So um, he says, I noticed that in the structure at different levels slide that you showed, one thing that wasn't on the list was a statistical mechanical probability distribution over microstates. This looks essential to the Albert picture, but you don't seem specially wedded to his precise account. So the question is, to what extent do you think introducing non-dynamical chance is essential for giving an account of emergent causation? Um, I think it's essential. And actually, what it, the probability postulate was meant to be the statistical mechanical probability distribution. And it's essential to the whole picture. So sorry if that wasn't clear. Great. Thanks for that clarification. And uh, we have another question from Peter Morgan, who is asking, are there other orderings than scale that we could have in mind for a side-on view? Systematic organizational uh, organization, for example. Ah, yes, absolutely. Um, and that would be natural in the biological context. Yes, I mean, that's, a, I absolutely. Thanks. Um, are there um, any other questions? Oh, great. Uh, so we have one from Jenny uh, who is asking, which role has causation in quantum mechanics for you? Okay. So um, there are two questions you might be asking. One is whether the quantum mechanics, whether quantum mechanics plays any role in this story? And the answer is no. So this, this whole sort of hierarchy 
is um, sort of erected on an effectively, the, as I told the picture, is erected on a kind of effectively classical level of description. Um, if you're asking, well, what does one say about causation in quantum mechanics? Huge open question. I think, you know, if, and, and you know, there are different ways that one can answer it depending on how one disambiguates um, the different notions of causation. So if you're asking, are there causal processes in quantum mechanics? Um, that is, you know, chains of interactions um, the, involving the, the, the um, exchange of uh, conserved quantity. Um, the answer is uh, not on, right now, not in space time is the answer to that. So if you're asking, are there um, uh, sort of inter interventionist notions of, cause, of causation that are applicable in quantum mechanics? The answer is yes. And in fact, some people have used interventionist notions to argue that quantum mechanics almost by its nature involves retrocausality. So you take the quantum formalism, you ask yourself, what happens if I intervene here? And you see causal relations under certain conditions running into the past. So um, big open question, really interesting question. And I think there's a number of different questions that one can ask, but it's not one that played any role um, in the story that I told. So um, um, we have a question, uh, sort of a clarification request from Paul. So is causation structure asymmetric at the macroscopic level? Uh, if you're saying it is not, how, that, how could that be given the low entropy state that we started from? At the macro, it absolutely is um, asymmetric. So again, you know, there was some, you know, I was sort of trying to assemble the big pieces. So I didn't go into details of each of the little ones. And when I did, it wasn't clear enough, but here's the idea. So you start the, the I'm gonna use kind of the Albert account, um, though you can make twiddles to the Albert account if you object to the particular form that he has of the past hypothesis of the probability postulate. Just clear as to say it in that setting. Here's the idea. You assume low entropy boundary condition. You take the present surveyable macro structure of the world and you ask what, and you assume a probability postulate. And you ask what happens if I intervene on a kind of, on my environment of, in, in, in the kind of way that we think of normally when we're talking about the sorts of manipulations that embedded agents like us can make. Right? How do you answer that question in the statistical mechanical framework? You take the probability distribution, you evolve it first past to find out whether the intervention makes a difference to the past. And then you evolve it forward to find out whether the intervention makes a difference to the future. When you evolve it backwards, if you're conditionalizing on a low entropy state in the past, you will get the result that it makes no difference to any event of which there is a macroscopic record. And if you think about it for like a minute and a half, you'll find out that includes pretty much everything that we could form any sort of belief about. There's at least potentially a macroscopic record of some kind about whether or not the event took place. If you do that in the forward direction, you say, again, you take the low entropy boundary condition in the past, present surveyable macro state of the world, and you ask what happens if I intervene on the environment. So I step in the sand, I build a house, I dig a ditch, and you can, and what you find when you when you evolve the probability distribution forward is pretty much what common sense thinks of um, as the effects of uh, those kinds of interventions are the ones that are assigned high probability by the probability distribution. So that's the way that you get the causal asymmetry out of the statistical mechanical account. So uh, then Ken Winkler has, um, has a question that actually I also had the same question, which is, can you say a bit more about your naturalistic pragmatism and your inclination to dispense with more traditional forms of philosophical analysis, perhaps by illustrating how it might be applied to one of the cases that you mentioned as you concluded? <laughs> this is the problem with giving a talk where you say too much. So that's a huge question. Um, but I'll say, for example, with information. So wait, let me say a little bit. Um, the kind of naturalistic pragmatism is not a conceptual analysis of these notions. So what it does is it takes as its target of, of explanation, um, you know, why would agents like us have developed concepts like that? 
What are the external, um, what are the external structures that support the application of those concepts? And how do those concepts figure in the internal economy of the agent? So think about something like information. This is a notion that's been, you know, sort of, it gets used a lot in physics, and it's one of these notions that's um, contested in the way that causation is, because many people will say, look, you're applying causal notions to, to physical explanation, but the notion, oh, sorry, the, no, the notion of information to physical explanation, but information isn't something that we can define directly in causal terms. It's intentionally laid, and it's got all of these associations that come from the use of language and so on. And what I want to say in a case like that is, well, just like the case of causation, you know, we can we can start at the fundamental level of um, of just physical description before we have the introduction of agents or anything like that with notions of information that are stripped down and that we can introduce in those stripped down ways that play a role in, in low level description, making sure that we're not importing associations. And then as we add matter and we add, you know, um, ultimate, and we add evolution, we add biology and we add ultimately um, agents that are not just using information to guide behavior, not, not only, in, okay, wait, let me back up. There's a crucial point. There's a crucial step in the case of information that's worth pausing to dwell on. When we're starting to talk about um, systems that were evolutionarily designed, we do get more structure in that can give rise to, that can impose a little bit more articulation on the notion of, of information. So now we have slightly richer notion and then we start getting um, systems that are using information in more and more sophisticated ways, ultimately agents that are introducing concepts and inferences. And again, it gets more articulated till finally we have something that's rich enough to be applied to um, linguistic interactions. So that's, that's another very schematic sketch of the kind of thing that I have in mind. And at no point do you say, you know, this is what information is. Information is purely physical or, or information is purely mental. It's something that plays a role at different levels of that hierarchy. Great. Um, I think, um... Peter Morgan um, comments, so crudely put, does a side on view say that the past hypothesis could be true or false as a global statement about all length or other scales, provided for example, all creatures like us start from the same direction in time with no memory? I'm not, so I'm gonna read the question again, because I'm not sure anything the past hypothesis could be true or false as a global statement. Yes, so the past hypothesis though is a statement about uh, the macro state of the world. So it says that the, the, the universe started in some micro state that has low entropy. That is, that is a member of a low entropy macro state when the, the thermodynamic coarse graining is applied. So it's by its nature, in a way, it classifies the early microstate of the world by reference to the, the thermodynamic coarse graining. Does that? Uh, okay. Peter, does that? Uh, yeah, I guess he oh, was I'm referring back to Carlos talk where he the focus was like on memory, right? Yeah. Right. So what I've been talking about uh, as um, the capacity of the universe to bear information about its past state. That's what Carlo was talking about when he talked about memory. So, um, and that depends entirely on the, the low entropy initial condition of the universe. Uh, just waiting to see if um, there are um, any further questions. Just give, uh, give people a minute. Um, so um, I don't see any pressing questions, but um, anyway, um, we could um, thank you so much, Anand. We can wrap up today and you know, if there are any questions, uh, you know, we can uh, hold on to them for our discussion session uh, tomorrow afternoon at the same time, 3 p.m. Uh, with uh, Jim uh, Woodward as the conversant and discussant with Janan. So 
Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. And a special thank you to Janan for a wonderful, inspiring talk. Thank, thank you. you for coming and thank you for having me. Yeah. Bye.